So good morning, everyone. It's Friday, May 29th, 10 o'clock. We're going to get started at Center Natural Resources and Energy. Uh, and we're meeting today to talk, uh, continue our discussion of the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, our first uh, witness is um, uh, Joyce Manchester uh, from the Joint Fiscal Office. And I don't know if she's been able to rejoin yet. Let's wait just a minute. She was on a moment ago. She's, I saw her as joined. Oh. Morning, Senator Campion. And I see Ms. Manchester again. Okay. So, uh, Ms. Manchester, if you could walk us through the fiscal note you prepared on uh, the House uh, Global Warming Solutions Act, that, that would be helpful. Yes, thank you very much. For the record, I'm Joyce Manchester with the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, I'm going to be walking through this fiscal note that I prepared based on the version of the bill that was passed by the House back in February. And uh, I did hear Peter Walk give testimony on Wednesday and I understand that there may be a change in the way that the council is made up. Um, so this refers to the original version of the bill as passed by the House. Okay, I'm now going to share my screen. Uh, hmm. I get made you co-host, Joyce. Thank you. I'm just not seeing the right screen pop up. At the bottom of the of the Zoom, it shows um, it shows screen share. I believe you click on that. No, I'm there. Oh. I'm there. I'm just trying to find my, here we go. Now it should work. Great. Boy, oh boy, I'm still not seeing it. Uh, hmm. Oh, I see all windows. Hold on, hold on. I got it. I got it. Uh, yeah. I'm good. There yes. you go. It looks like it's going to come right. on. Yay, yes. Joy. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're, we're all okay. on the job learning. Thanks for exactly. A new skill. All right, yeah. so here we are. This is H688. Uh, the appropriation needed at this point is rather limited in that we're really only talking about the three new FTE positions at ANR and uh, the per diems and expenses for non government workers who would be attending the council meetings. So as the bill was passed by the House, the Vermont Climate Council was composed of 22 people and at least four subcommittees. And I understand that those subcommittees could move around, but um, we'll see how that goes. Um, as you know, the council in the current bill is responsible for identifying, analyzing, and evaluating strategies and programs to ensure that Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions will meet some targets or some goals or whatever you want to call them. So um, the goals are there. The, the requirement is that the council will adopt the Vermont Climate Action Plan on or before December 1st, 2021, and will update it every four years thereafter. So in FY21, there would be expenses that need appropriations in three areas. You will see that in this fiscal note, I have lumped together the appropriations needed for both FY21 and FY22. And the reason for that back in the late days of February was that we thought that FY21 was going to look pretty good in terms of uh, revenues coming in. And so we thought that lumping the two years together would give ANR a little bit more certainty about the funds they would have to spend over the coming two years. Now you may decide in, in light of the current dismal revenue situation that you wanna split that out and, and that would be absolutely fine with us. And uh, I, I could simply rewrite this to show that. But let's go through FY21 first. And certainly if there are questions, please let me know as uh, I'm going um, to ask. Mr. Chair. Oh. Yeah, please. Um, I, I'm, I have completely misunderstood. I thought the, the witness was gonna 
talk to us about the economic issues surrounding climate change and and the costs of the of to the state of not taking action and things of that nature. So this seems to be a report that the appropriations committee would be interested in. But um but am I incorrect? Um, so yeah, we'll actually address both. So for now, just because it'll Thank you. be Thank you. You know, every year we send a note onto a probe saying we're we're making an ask and here's what it is and why. So we need to know uh, what we'd be asking for. Should we move the bill as it's currently constructed? But I take your, your points well taken. There's a, some very large other numbers not on the table about uh, impacts of the status quo, for instance, right now. Well, so that's we'll, where yeah. I thought we were going to, the, the, uh, the economic you know, um, dangers of doing nothing as, uh, as reported to us by our JFO and, and um, other studies. Thank you. Right. Looking forward to it. <laughs> well, yes, okay, we so I, on, quick sure. question to Ms. Manchester. So uh, I'm thinking back, you were part of the group. We, I'm now not remembering the, quite the, uh, the initials. If it was RFF or RSG or, you know, the, we, we had a, a lengthy detailed study from them roughly a year ago, right? That's um, correct. And you were part of that group that did the request for proposal and all that. So Absolutely. Uh, I'm thinking of that document as maybe something that captures uh, information related to Senator McDonald's question. Am I remembering that right, would you say? That is, that is absolutely right. We, we actually uh, helped to organize two different studies. One was by RFF, and that was looking at um, decarbonization uh, methods, um, approaches to achieve decarbonization, and they looked at various approaches from a carbon tax to a, a, an auction, um, and they did a very nice job of laying out the economic implications of doing that work sooner rather than later. We also were involved in a second study that was completed by RAP, the Regulatory Assistance Project, and they looked at specific areas in which Vermont could invest. Um, uh, uh, what's, what's the word for the, the heating, the heating of yeah. homes and so <laughs> forth. Yeah, okay, great. So, right. we'll so, so that's all out there and that's been done. And also as part of this bill, there is a request that JFO put together a new RFP for a study that would look at uh, more of the uh, mitigation methods that could be used as part of this this whole global warming solutions act so that's that's a, a future study and we need to uh, put together a, a study proposal for that that could be approved by by folks in the legislature okay great so let's go back to the, the note you have and then we'll i'll follow up with you about um pulling up the wrap and rff work we already have to see um if we can reconsider that, because we actually had both those in committee, um, but it's been a while, so thanks. Yes, absolutely. Good, thank you. Okay, so we're looking at estimated expenses for FY21. Uh, ANR has requested three additional FTEs, a staff director, a data analyst with expertise in greenhouse gas emission measurement, verification, and mitigation, and a lawyer with regulatory expertise. Now those are general descriptions and those uh, jobs might change a little bit, but that's, that's the general idea. So we were thinking salary about 80,000 each, benefits at about 40%, possible additional costs for equipment, space and training. And that gives us 336,000 for, for one fiscal year for those three additional FTEs. Then we were also looking at about $50,000 for per diems and expenses for the members of the council and the subcommittee meetings who are not legislative employees or government employees. Um, and I was guessing that the council might meet 10 times annually if every one of the 14 members not employed by state government would participate and request per diem, then the estimated maximum state cost would be about 17,675. 
actual expense is likely lower. And you can see the math on how that comes about. Thank you. And then we have four subcommittees. If they were to meet six times annually and each of the 10 or 11 subcommittee members not employed by state government would participate and request per diem, then that expense comes out to be about 31,815 per year. In addition to those two uses, we also recommend 200,000 in funds for public outreach and or consultants. So these would be consultants who would help the, the council and ANR and or ANR um, with, with expertise that may not be in house. So that's 200,000. Um, and, and we imagined that that would stretch over the two years, but certainly if you're gonna hire a consultant, it takes time to get up and running and then you, you want them to, to be part of the process. So it would probably go over the two years. So the FY21 total estimated spending 586,000. FY22, we don't have the 200,000, but we have the other two expenses um, at about the same level. So FY22 would be 386,000. So if you choose to only appropriate money for the coming fiscal year, FY21, you would be looking at 586,000. And then of course, there would be indirect effects on state spending uh, we don't have dollar amounts to assign to these categories, but certainly agriculture, ACCD, transportation, all of those folks would see some impact of implementing the Global Warming Solutions Act. And then we would have longer term effects on state spending. Again, we have not assigned dollar values, but certainly they're out there. Effects on state government through the fleet as we change from gas powered vehicles to electric powered vehicles, uh, buildings, heating expenses, maintenance, new construction, and of course, fiscal impact on cities and towns that would be coming down the pike. Senator Bray, you're muted. Thing. Thank you for a concise summary of, uh, you know, big picture, 30,000 foot view of what might be entailed and moving forward. Um, okay, uh, any committee questions for Ms. Manchester? All right, well now you're uh, flight certified for screen sharing. <laughs> right. Uh, right, also on the committee page is, is a simple chart that shows you where global health, global, uh, greenhouse gas emissions have been in Vermont in recent history and shows you where the target levels are. So um, we don't need to look at that now unless there's a request, but I just thought it would be helpful to see where we've been and where we're going. Okay, um, so uh, I'm not sure which documents you're referring to. Can you explain a little more? So I, let's see. I don't know if it's something we've um, seen yet. Uh, we. I've uh, I've withdrawn her screen share, although it appears she's still got control. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> okay, right. Yes, so so that's the chart that I put together. Other people have made similar charts. I just thought it was um, right. perhaps useful to have it ready to to look at. And I've labeled the various uh, target dots and explained where they're coming from. So you can see the blue dots are, are absolute history. That's what we know from ANR in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. You can see the two estimates that Peter Walk talked about on Wednesday are in dark red there. The ANR forecasts are the yellowish dots. Um, the 2025 target is just below the, 26, the 2016, I'm sorry, just below the ANR forecast for 2026. So it looks like the lift to get to the 2025 target would not be too burdensome. Uh, however, moving to the 2030 and 2050 targets would require significant reductions. Right, great. Um, can you send that on, to, uh, I don't know if it's a, a link or, or if you could just send it on to June and she'll 
put it on. I actually, it's on I the actually website. picked it up from your website. So it's on, it's on the website. It's on, it's on right. today's documents. It's, yeah. okay. it's today posted. You're, in, you're ahead of me. Thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. If there are no more questions for Ms. Manchester, thanks very much for your help. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any. Then um, we'll go next to uh, Mr. Coda. Good morning, Matt. Good morning. Uh, can anyone, everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Senator Bray, members of the Senate Natural Resources Committee, uh, to talk briefly about the Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, my name is Matt Coda. For the record, I'm executive director of uh, VFDA, a position I've held since 2007. Uh, VFDA is a nonprofit trade association of energy businesses. We provide regulatory assistance while facilitating technical training, safety, and education programs that are required uh, here in the state of Vermont for certification and licensure. We operate the Vermont Fuel Training Center, which is the leading provider of technical training for plumbing and heating industry uh, for techs and plumbers. A uh, quick snapshot of my involvement in these types of discussions over the past 13 years or so. Um, I've served on the Governor Shumlin's Thermal Efficiency Task Force and Governor Scott's Climate Action Commission. Um, I, I pushed in 2010 for Vermont's ultra low sulfur fuel mandate, which has a, taken effect uh, to reduce emissions and increase efficiency in heating. Uh, I've spent the past decade advocating for renewable biodiesel for heating and transportation here in Vermont. Um, I've advocated for uh, regulations that ensure that liquid fuel is delivered safely and stored securely through the passage of Vermont's uh, above ground storage tank regulations. Um, I've distributed over $200,000 over the last two years in rebates directly to Vermont consumers so that they can um, install safe fuel oil tanks that are compliant with these AST regulations. I helped create the Efficiency Excellence Network with Efficiency Vermont about 10 years ago and was an original member of Energy Action Now, which is now called um, Energy Action Network. I say all that to underscore the fact that I'm not just here saying no to the GWSA, but I am saying no to the GWSA and I ask you not to pass this legislation as written. Uh, and here's why. Having served on these kinds of committees as stated prior, uh, similar to the proposed Climate Council, either informally or formally, um, let me pull back the curtain for those that don't know. Suggested solutions by these volunteer committees um, are often done in self-interest. Uh, for instance, in page seven of the Climate Council uh, number F or letter F, um, there is a member um, representing the fuel industry. I can tell you if I'm named to this committee, I will advocate for policies that focus on deliverable renewables, biomass and biodiesel. Um, that's gonna happen. Uh, I'm certain that the representative from electric utilities will push for more electric heat, understandable. Um, it's happened in the PUC for the, the 2015 Energy Act when we meet every year to talk about tier three, how to reduce fossil fuel consumptions. And, and usually um, the geothermal guy advocates for ge more geothermal. The biomass advocate wants more to burn more wood. The solar company wants to sell more solar panels. This is perfectly understandable and I'm a part of it too. Um, but because of this, these committees should be advisory only. I listened to the testimony on YouTube last night to, it did, it did get uploaded. Thank you for, for advising me on that. Um, and I was struck that I had a very similar concern as Senator Mark McDonald. Um, if I'm paraphrasing the Senator correctly, um, there was a concern that you expressed that the agency wouldn't get put together a plan, uh, wouldn't get anything done uh, as evidenced by past um, committees meeting. And my concern, I think, is on the other side of the exact same coin. What if this client? Permits inherent in the law, but has other negative consequences. And the, the legislature has no opportunity to weigh in. It will go through the rulemaking process. LCAR will listen. And the agency has the authority to enact the plan as they've devised it. No votes will ever occur on the House or Senate floor. And the reason why this is a concern is that there will be there will be solutions suggested in which uh, in which someone has an idea that on paper makes sense. Here's a common one that I hear. Um, I'm the chair of the South Burlington Development Review Board. I've served on numerous energy efficiency committees. I hear this one all the time. Update the stretch code to eliminate fossil fuels and apply the same efficiency standards to all residential housing in Vermont. 
a common uh, request. Uh, and it hasn't happened. Uh, and it's not new to Vermont. In fact, the next week in Massachusetts, the Board of Building Regulations and Standards is considering modifying their stretch code to, quote, limit, restrict, or ban the installation of any fossil fuel infrastructure in new construction or home modifications. There's no question if you don't install another oil burner in another house in Massachusetts or Vermont uh, or a gas burner, you will reduce emissions. Uh, but it'll also drive up the cost of housing and it will make it much more difficult for those of us in our individual states, individual cities and towns that have affordable housing goals to meet those goals. Uh, furthermore, it would require an enforcement mechanism that we don't, doesn't exist in most of Vermont. Sure, if you change the stretch code to say, no more fossil fuels, um, you may prevent a utility gas company in Chittenden County from laying any more pipe, but how do you prevent a homeowner in Brandon from installing an oil burner in their house? You can't because they don't need to pull a permit. Um, here's another effective uh, but unpopular climate solution that this council could come up with and implement without a vote on the floor. Uh, tell you we could eliminate 10 million gallons, 10 million gallons of fossil fuels overnight. Overnight. All you have to do is ban the use of federal light heat funds for oil, heat, kerosene, propane, and natural gas. All we have to do is tell the 20,000 low income Vermont families that if they want free heat, call the electric company or burn wood. On paper, it's simple. The government can stop paying fuel dealers to deliver fuel. Uh, but in practice, thousands of Vermonters <laughs> go cold in the effort to prevent global warming. Um, I don't think anyone on this committee wants this. I don't think anyone in the Senate or the House wants this. But what are the guardrails to prevent the Climate Council from implementing such measures? The guardrails are the legislature. The legislature should ultimately give a thumbs up or thumbs down to whatever an advisory Climate Council suggests, don't reject, uh, don't give up the authority uh, to reject a well-meaning uh, but misguided plan. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. Well, I, I, I appreciate that you've provided some examples of, uh, you know, laws or rules that could be passed because um, when we leave it as rules will be written to reduce emissions, it's, uh, it all sounds rather attractive to, to most party, to every party really. But uh, in the end, we need to say, well, how are you gonna achieve that? What's, the, what's happening out there in the real world that gets you there? And um, those decisions, as you've pointed out, become uh, political ones. Like what are we willing to do uh, as a society? And um, so it is a little hard for me to imagine that the legislature wouldn't be part of speaking on behalf of the people they represent to make those choices for this the state. Um, yeah. um, Senator Campion. Uh, Matt, I apologize. I had to step out for a moment. Would you mind uh, just shooting me an email or maybe we can talk later about uh, what you shared with the committee? Sure. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll look for an email. Just a little, just a little bit of a summary. I, I apologize that I had to step out. Uh, Senator McDonald. Um, thank you, um, Matt. Matt gave us a list of things that he's done that have been environmentally sound, and the hard work he's put in for um, low sulfur, sulfur fuels and um, and other such work. Um, during that time. Um, our thermal and um, highway work has been graded to be D minus to an F. Um, we continue to buy uh, huge amounts of fossil fuels and ship 80% of the dollars out of state. Um, how would, um, perhaps the witness could get, tell us what the number one way he would deal with reducing um, transportation uses based on fuels? Well, ban the combustion engine, right? That's not my suggestion, but that has been suggested. Um, put, a, put a stop date uh, when the car dealer can stop selling a gasoline powered car. That's not my suggestion. These are the hard choices that the legislature should make, not this climate council. In a laboratory, we can figure out how to reduce emissions well below the, 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 the benchmarks that we've created. Um, the goals that we've created, but there are consequences. And are we prepared? Now, I know there's some people that are prepared to accept those consequences. 
um, if we stop letting people, uh, you know, COVID has revealed that. Our sales are down for the, for the four, five, six weeks right after the stay at home order, our sales were down 50, 60% in terms of uh, um, gasoline sales. That's an effective way to reduce emissions. It also has a negative effect on the economy. So what's the trade off? Ultimately, 22 people in a room making whatever the per diem is, shouldn't be deciding these policies. It should be the legislature. I wouldn't advocate for banning the combustion engine, but the legislature might, and that's their right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Matt. Okay. Um, uh, any other questions for Ms. Dakota? Okay, thanks for jumping in and um, joining us today. I'd like then to um, invite next to join us, um, Mr. McDougall from the Attorney General's office. And um, I don't know, good morning, Mr. McDougall, we can see you. Morning. And Senator, you? I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Driscoll is next. Uh, um, Mr. McDougall said he wasn't available until 1030. So we can switch it if you'd like. I'm just trying to follow the schedule. Hey, uh, maybe I didn't refresh my screen recently enough. Um, can uh, Mr. Driscoll, are you fine going after Mr. McDougall? Yes. Okay, I'm looking maybe at an agenda that's one one uh, headed back. So uh, again, thanks for joining us uh, and bringing the expertise of the Attorney General's office to the committee. Everyone has a copy of your January 29 memo that you wrote uh, to House Energy and Technology. And we've been having discussions around some of the, the questions that you've um, addressed in your memo. Um, and I thought maybe if you, uh, there's, you have four questions, four answers in here, if maybe we could do questions one and then four, uh, and then double back as time allows to get into some of the other questions. And you have a colleague from your office on the, with you. And if you could introduce, if you could both introduce yourselves to the committee, because I don't think we've seen you this year. Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you very much for having us this morning. Uh, my name is Rob McDougall. I'm the chief of the Environmental Protection Division at the Attorney General's office. Uh, and with me this morning is Laura Murphy, who's one of our great assistant attorneys general in the Environmental Protection Division and who has helped um, work on that memo that you just mentioned, Senator, uh, and also our kind of Global Warming Solutions Act um, work this session. I just might start by saying that the Attorney General um, strongly supports this bill and the policies behind it. Uh, the climate crisis is real. The time for environmental leadership is now. We view this bill as a strong, bold step in the right direction for Vermont to meaningfully reduce greenhouse gas emissions and build resiliency in our changing climate. Um, we're happy to talk about any questions you have or go into different areas of the bill um, from this point. Sure. Um, and and uh, so working off the memo you've already done, I think one question that came up with it won't take us long is your very first question in the memo. And number four, I think, is where we've maybe had some of our lengthier discussions so far. So if we could uh, use those, and we'll work from that. Thanks. Or do you want to? Uh, sure, ha happy to step in here. So I think for question one, this, this came up, um, as you know, in the House committee. And the basic um, question is whether with the rule, um, the rules that a &R would develop under the Global Warming Solutions Act, could they impose a tax or a fee just through the rulemaking? And basically for taxes, the answer is no, um, that, that requires legislative approval. So, you know, potentially the Climate Council may recommend some sort of tax that would need to be approved by the legislature. That's the short answer. And then for the fee, um, most fees also need to be approved by the legislature. There are some exceptions for, for certain small things, but, and this is, this is where if an agency is going to charge a fee for its services, right, or, or for a license or something like that. Most of those need legislative approval. As you probably know, there's a fee schedule that's set perhaps annually. Um, there are some small exceptions. So I, I can't remember, but things like um, 
you know, if you want to charge a, a transcript fee or something like that, that that may not be subject to legislative approval. So that's the really short answer on that one. And I don't know if if, um, if there are any questions on question one. Uh, Senator McDonald. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'll wait till both questions have been done. Okay. Certainly. And then for, for should I move on to question four? Yeah, and if you could, uh, just in case people don't have your uh, memo right in front of you, if you could read the question to people too, that would be helpful. Sure, so this question was whether the legislature is ceding too much policymaking authority to the executive branch in the rulemaking allowed under the bill. So we looked at this question not from, as a policy matter, should the legislature cede this authority to the agencies, and or the council, but if if authority is ceded, is it constitutional, right? So under the constitution, both federal and state, there's a doctrine called the non-delegation doctrine. And basically what that means is, you know, under separation of powers, the legislature is supposed to make laws and make policy. And that's really the role of the legislature. However, as we know, certainly the legislature can delegate authority to agencies to make rules, to implement policy. And so the question arises under the non-delegation of doctrine, when the legislature delegates authority to an agency in a statute or to some other body, has it ceded too much authority? And the question, that you have to answer there is, well, has the legislature provided sufficient guidance to the agency about basically how to develop the rules and what to do? And the standard, um, as we discussed in the memo, is it's not a high standard. It's a pretty low bar. There, there needs to be an intelligible principle that the legislature has provided to the agency to help the agency implement the act. Um, there needs to be some sort of policy guidance or, or standard for the agency to follow. So we looked at the bill um, with, with those principles in mind and our view, of course, there's, we never can guarantee anything, but our view is that the bill is currently drafted is constitutional under this doctrine. And, and that's because there is a fair amount of guidance provided to the agency. So of course there's guidance about process, about developing the rules. There are very specific greenhouse gas reductions that need to be met through the rules. There are very specific timelines, but even more importantly, in sections 592B, which is what outlines what the climate action plan needs to look like. And then also in 592D, which is where we have the objectives of the act that need to be achieved that's a lot of guidance for a &R to work with and for the council to work with in developing the programs and strategies to achieve the reductions. Um, I mean, I could give you some examples, but you're probably quite familiar with those. Um, so, so that's our analysis on that issue. Um, and it, the, uh, okay. Well, let me look up any committee questions on number four. No, that's very helpful though, thank you. Um, the, uh, the, uh, another piece of the discussion along the way has been if the council writes a plan, uh, and then it's kicked over to, um, rulemaking, it goes to the agencies, a and uh, for rulemaking, should the legislature play a role in, uh, approving the plan, uh, or, you know, that, that was, there have been, there's two flavors of that question. One is, does the administration alone actually um, send a plan over having worked with uh, a smaller version of the council with non uh, people who are not part of the administration uh, performing an advisory role so that it stays the administration speaking to the administration with outside advisors. So that's one version of things. Another version was, uh, you might keep the entire group of 22 together, but to provide a, uh, a check-in with the legislature and that uh, any plan before rulemaking was invoked 
would, would have a legislative approval. So we don't have a ratification process. Resolutions aren't binding. Probably it would mean that we would have a bill that would include the plan. So do you have any thoughts about the desirability, necessity of uh, enhancing the legislature's role in that way by sort of coming back to the legislature? So I think I would say from a constitutional perspective, I don't, um, I don't think that that really has an effect. I, and Rob, you can correct me if I'm wrong. That, I think that is more of a policy matter. What, what's the legislature's preference really? Um, one thing that I think we have mentioned before, of course, is the more steps that are in the process, the longer potentially things might take to happen. Um, but I think that that would be our response on that. And that, that's what we've testified to in other committees that, you know, the Vermont <clears throat> has fallen behind its uh, neighboring states in achieving our greenhouse gas reduction goals. And so the um, idea that this <coughs> creates an ambitious timeline and an ambitious schedule to meet these goals, uh, they're, they're not goals anymore, they're requirements. Uh, and so that um, whether it's a policy question to insert more steps into the process, but that would just have the effect of perhaps stretching out the timeline in a way. Mr. McDonald. Um, for uh, Ms. Ms. Murphy, um, the, I believe your testimony um, explains what the, what would happen when this committee prom, um, came up with its plan. Um, if the committee comes up with no plan um, and the administration is then sets for sets forward to come up with rules. Um, is that not a different situation? So I don't think it is. Um, under the the act as it's currently drafted, um, the if there's no plan, right, the agency still has to develop the rules. And currently, I believe the language says when the agency does that, it has to write the rules to achieve the objectives in the act, which are in section 592D. Um, I don't think the legislation currently says that the rules should also follow 592B, which is what outlines what the plan needs to look like. Um, so I think one could read the statute to say, well, if the agency is going to have to write the rules without a plan, certainly they have to follow the objectives in 592B. It would be wise probably to also follow the guidelines and standards in 592B. That's potentially something the legislature could make explicit in the event um, there's no plan, but I, I still think as currently drafted, the agency still would have, even without a plan, sufficient guidance in the statute from a constitutional perspective. And then Thank you also you. have, um, those, I was gonna say, you also have those cause of actions to make sure the rules are doing what they're supposed to do as a kind of backstop on the rulemaking process. Uh, that the, the ability to be a backstop in an, in an appropriate time is limited by um, when the legislature happens to meet and when, um, this administration and past administrations, no, this is not a criticism of it, but one, um, have often prom, you know, promulgated rules when the legislature wasn't around to, um, to object. Um, and my concern is in the absence of, the, uh, of a plan um, and the bill doesn't call for, doesn't have in it a mechanism for the, the group to meet if it's not called by the secretary of administration in the absence of a plan, um, there's no opportunity for the legislature to exercise the, its authority um, or not exercise its authority. And that's my concern with the way the bill is drafted at this time. And, and I, Senator, only meant backstop on the, the causes of action. So there's three causes of action created by the Global Warming Solutions Act, of course. One is the deadline suit, where someone can bring a lawsuit if the ANR does not write the rules. The second is a suit if the rules don't meet the goals as specified in the legislation. Uh, and then the third is the existing, um, it's not created by the, the, the bill, but it's that existing APA rulemaking challenge. So if the rulemaking process isn't um, 
going appropriately, then someone can challenge the rulemaking process. So there's the opportunity for individuals to challenge the rules that are coming out, if not the legislature. And we're, we, then we get into days and months and years on, a, on something that we consider to be um, more immediate. Um, that last question, I think I already know the answer to, um, which is the Attorney General's office ever intervened to say that the uh, administration was failing to carry out the laws of the state of Vermont? Not to my knowledge, Senator. We, um, you know, obviously we're typically in the, the position of defending the state and making sure that um, people are working. We work with our client agencies to make sure that we're following the laws. And But I, I don't know of a case where we've intervened to say that we've not met the goals or rules in place. Okay. Which is why we have, I guess, the Conservation Law Foundation that occasionally steps up and fulfills that role. Thank you. On um, the uh, suit being the uh, potential to bring suit, um, the, we've had a little committee discussion around uh, Rule 75 as an existing opportunity to bring uh, suit or written mandamus, I guess it is, um, as opposed to the explicitly adding a cause of action clause <clears throat> in, in this bill. Can you say a little bit about uh, how uh, Rule 75 has or has not provided opportunities for Vermonters to bring, uh, you know, action, a cause of action suit? Sure. It, oh, Laura, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sure. And Rob, please jump in. Um, yep. I right. So, so Rule seventy five is provides the procedures that apply once you get into court under, for instance, a writ of mandamus. So there's still so it's not a cause of action of itself, yep. but there still has to be some underlying cause of action to get you into court. And for Rule seventy five, it's it's one of the old writs basically. In terms of the deadline suit, A and R just fails to to adopt the rules on time, it would probably be a writ of mandamus. I do think that that um, is an existing cause of action. However, rule those writs can get confusing and complicated. And so having this very clear cause of action in the statute only helps, I think, to make it clear that yes, we have a suit here. Um, there's no question about getting into court under one of the writs. I mean, I do think you could, that would be the right view, but I, I certainly think having the cause of action helps to make that clear. Okay, great. Um, and Rule 75, Senator, is a, a cause of action that courts are very familiar with. There's hundreds of uh, Rule 75 cases um, pending at any given time. Um, it's a very common cause of action. Okay. Um, the other, another provision in, in the bill was, uh, and just historically speaking, this committee's twice passed cause of action bills as part of the Clean Water Act. Um, they didn't survive the full legislative process. So um, I'm not leaning, again, I'm not challenging on these things. I'm just trying to test a little. Uh, there is There are provisions uh, for covering costs um, and um, ANR's proposal and response uh, doesn't in include such a feature. Um, I don't know what kind of costs someone would incur, but um, uh, does it seem a reasonable thing to empower citizens of the state to cover costs if they bring such a suit and prevail? So the um, attorney general, when he testified in the House committee, uh, believes that that's a very important government accountability piece of this bill. Um, and it makes sure that the state lives up to its end of what it's supposed to do um, parties can recover costs already, um, but the fees uh, is the new piece. Uh, maybe, Lord, do you want to explain that just a little bit more, um, the existing? Sure, right. So under existing law, um, normal types of costs can be recovered by the prevailing party filing fees, things like that. It certainly doesn't hurt to spell it out either, um, certainly. And for attorney's fees, in Vermont, we basically follow the rule that there has to be some sort of statutory authorization for a party to recover attorney's fees unless it's exceptional circumstances. So having it spelled out here that the prevailing or substantially prevailing plaintiff can recover attorney's fees 
is is very important. And I, I think it's true, um, the Attorney General did testify earlier that this is an, an important accountability piece. It can help, and certainly at the federal level, these types of provisions are used to help citizens um, have the means to actually hold government accountable in certain places. I would mention here, if I can, there currently in the bill, it doesn't say that the state can recover fees and costs. It only says costs. We believe that was an oversight. So we would just ask that the state can recover fees. And this is only if the suit is frivolous. So we, we would ask for that provision to be added. Okay. Um, since uh, this is your bailiwick, can you send an email to the committee expressing that in what you believe is an appropriate manner? Thank you. May I ask a quick question uh, of Laura? Sure. Or and then Senator, uh, well, Senator Parent, then Senator Campion. Okay, I apologize. Thanks. So I, I have a question. So if the state gets sued, you know, for not meeting these goals or perceived to not be make, meeting these goals, how vigorously will the Attorney General's office actually defend the state, or are you going to? take more of the side that, yeah, we didn't defend these goals. You know, I always figured that it's the attorney general's office's job to fight for the state. Um, you, know, you know, what would you do in a situation like this? We would defend our client zealously and vigorously as we do in every case. It's an ethical obligation of our office and um, we would absolutely. And certainly for, if I could also add for the, for the deadline suits, um, that first cause of action, that's really straightforward. Either the rule was adopted on time or it wasn't. So we would probably think that those cases would be really straightforward, wouldn't last very long. There wouldn't be much to dispute about. I mean, it's the second cause of action where, where mm -hmm. it gets more complicated um, and would require, you know, honestly, probably factual testimony and expert testimony. That, that's a good point, Laura. The um, the first cause of action, the deadline, you know, whether we did the, whether the state did the rule on time or not, that's a very uh, straightforward case that probably would be decided on paper and there would not be a lot of costs or fees associated with it. The second case, uh, the challenge to whether the rules were effective or not is where there'd be more exposure to uh, attorneys' fees and costs. Did this uh, go through House Judiciary? Uh, yes. It we did. testified okay. in House Judiciary. Yep. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Because I'm th just thinking about timing here, and it should probably end up in a Senate Judiciary as well. Okay. Thank you. We testified, Senator, just basically on the cause of action section there in the House Judiciary, at least for right. more. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, and can you uh, explain a little bit about the the term "substantially prevail"? How, how do I'm always nervous when I see an adverb. <laughs> Sure. So um, I won't be able to give a lot of detail. This is a really a common standard um, under federal environmental laws. Um, and, at the, and so it gives the court discretion, basically. So there may be, for instance, a case that has multiple theories or multiple causes of action or um, multiple asks for certain types of remedies. And so the, the plaintiff may not achieve all of that in the case but may achieve most of it, right? Or may get to the goal of having the agency write the rules in a certain way. So that basically just gives the court to discretion, discretion to decide, yeah, this, the plaintiff suit was really a big piece of us getting to the finish line. Um, there, there's certainly gonna be case law about how courts have assessed prevailing versus substantially prevailing, but it is, it is a standard that's common and it does give the court discretion to, to make that judgment. Um, last question um, is, and we can schedule more time as we get closer to uh, you know, a finished bill, uh, but the um, is around, uh, did you spend any time analyzing the extent of existing rulemaking authority of any state agency that might actually be brought into making the Global Warming Solutions Act work? You know, like, do they have rulemaking uh, powers in terms of defining uh, performance standards for uh, buildings and structures or gas mileage for vehicles? I mean, I'm wondering some of the tools they might use, some of the rules they might write. I don't know if you've looked at whether they, they already have the power to do that or they need a uh, direct authority granted through legislation. 
Senator, that's not something we looked at and we would defer to the agencies uh, and their own expertise about their authorities under their rulemaking powers. Um, our suggestion would be that the clearer the finished product is, the better it's gonna be for the agencies to um, determine whether they have that authority or not. Okay, great. Um, any other questions from the committee? Okay, so thanks so much for uh, your help today. And um, I'm guessing more questions will come up as we keep working our way along and we'll get back in touch. So thanks again. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn to uh, Mr. Driscoll. Thank you for uh, joining us this morning and accepting a little reshuffle on the, the batting order there. Oh, no problem at all, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. And, and before I start, I do have a little bit of background noise where I'm at. Can you hear me okay? Or uh, Sounds good here. Thank you. Sounds I prefer, good. I prefer not to turn off my fan in this. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Uh, yeah. uh, so thank you. Thank you again uh, for the record. Uh, William Driscoll with Associated Industries of Vermont. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to touch on this bill. I'd like to just address some of our you know, broad concerns and we can certainly talk in more specific uh, in writing or as you continue working on this. Um, I think we'll be touching on a lot of the issues the committee has already been uh, considering and looking at. And I think I start off with a similar area of concern highlighted by Matt Coda earlier. And this comes down to um, the authority of the council uh, relative to uh, the administration and to the legislature. Um, and this and other things are this is largely, these are largely process issues. Uh, I think this is, this is largely a process bill as opposed to, you know, debate over substantive policies. Um, but when it comes to substantive policies or responses, when it comes to specific direction to uh, A&R or, or potentially other agencies to get into specific uh, rules and regulations, uh, there are obviously many different ways to approach uh, greenhouse gas reductions and controls. And those different approaches, they all have their own uh, cost effectiveness. They all have their own trade-offs. Um, and when it comes to trying to make the best decisions, uh, there are at least two factors that are important to reach those decisions that I think are, are, are not best served in, in the bill as it's currently structured. There's the question of um, adequate input and, um, and, and control from various stakeholders who may have different and or competing uh, interests or priorities. And there's also the accountability for the decisions being made. Um, and I think the more the authority rests within this committee that raises the question of uh, what is really the accountability of that committee or council for its decisions and um, are different stakeholders or interests being either represented or listened to. Um, you know, there's the question of, do you have the right people at the table? Are there issues raised when some stakeholders have a vote at the table and other stakeholders don't? Um, and then again, what's the accountability that the council might make? And I think in that sense, uh, the issue is- Mr. Driscoll, can I ask a quick question? So uh, uh, in terms of representation, are there, um, are you in part uh, arguing for, uh, um, a broader council, like more more people, uh, that there are voices missing. Uh, yeah, to some extent, yes, and actually, and I am going to get to that. Um, what I want to try to address is the, is the question of legislative approval, primarily, which is the, the first one. Then there's issues of the membership and focus of the council, uh, and then there's also the questions of the cause of action and the mandatory nature of the goals. So those are the the, the topics I'll try to get through. Um, okay. And sorry, one more interruption. Um, I'm going to ask, we have uh, 30 minutes with a, a totally hard stop called the Senate floor. So mm -hmm. I'll ask you to try to wrap up by five after. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I should be very long. Um, I, so what we would primarily recommend is when it comes to sort of specific or substantive directions, such as in the plan for actual rules and regulations, that the, that that would require a legislative review and approval um, so that uh, if the, they're given, given direction what they need to do, that direction should come from the legislature as it would with any other uh, topic. 
or issue area in the normal process. Uh, we think that would be most appropriate. Uh, in the in our world about earlier this week, which makes the uh, council may more advisory, uh, and then while that falls primarily upon the administration, there is some accountability there too. That's a somewhat different approach, but I think our primary concern is to have the legislature approve the substantive direction uh, for, for rulemaking. Um, you know, we can have a longer discussion of, of issues that you've already addressed in terms of the inadequacy of LCAR or the opportunity to step in and intervene or try to reverse things um, by the legislature being a substitute for that initial approval. Um, we don't believe that those are adequate substitutes to that approach and it should instead be that the council will make its recommendations and then the legisl legislature will adopt those or, or not adopt them um, as, as that process uh, unfolds. Um, so going down the line from that backing up a bit, and this becomes more of an issue, the more authority the council has, it is the question of representation. Um, I think from our perspective, obviously we represent primarily manufacturing, um, you know, industrial processes are obviously a part of the uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, issue. Uh, it's an important uh, part of the economy and definitely uh, both a contributor to and, and, and an impacted party um, as these kind of policies are pursued. And we do believe that, that a manufacturing representative uh, would be a good uh, addition to the array of stakeholders that are on the council. Um, and on a related matter, uh, you know, one of the big impacts and, and concerns for manufacturing uh, is transportation. And I think having a, a more tra uh, transportation, uh, a more dedicated transportation representative on the council would also be, would also be helpful, given that that's such a big part of this whole, this whole debate. Um, beyond membership, there's also focus. And not surprisingly, obviously, one of our big concerns in terms of making decisions between what kinds of different policies ought to be pursued in the overall goals of climate of uh, greenhouse gas reductions is um, how do you how do you minimize uh, cost impacts uh, and administrative burdens, and how do you maximize positive positive economic incentives or assistance uh, for companies? And I think to be fair, uh, some of those factors are interwoven to some degree within uh, the bill. If you look at the second and third subcommittees, um, the cross-sector mitigation and the uh, just transitions, certainly some of those elements are included within the charges of those subcommittees, but uh, we believe the bill with the, the process would benefit by having a more dedicated uh, and focused, focused look at that, of balancing that criteria in the process, whether that's uh, by amending the charges of the, of the existing subcommittee or creating a subcommittee that looks specifically at trying to uh, uh, work various proposals through that through that filter or through that matrix. Um, I think that would all, we would believe that that would also be helpful. Um, and then finally, it's, it's a somewhat interconnected issue of the cause of action and the mandatory nature of the goals. Um, we generally have a concern about private rights of action, whether they be against the state or against um, other private parties. Uh, you know, it tends to uh, create more of a, of a tense or litigious aspect of things. It raises issues of litigating uh, rules and legislation rather than uh, legislating them. Um, and we believe also uh, if that's combined with making these goals mandatory, uh, it, it creates a lot of undue complications or, or, or issues. You know, when it comes to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, you're really talking about in many ways, modifying human behavior, uh, trying to try to do policy goals that encourage and discourage certain behaviors. And that is a fuzzy process. You can certainly try to bend curves, which is, you know, even more popular term these days and things like that, but it's not precise science. And I think the, pr the prospect that say we hit, you know, we're one percentage off of a goal when one of the things come up that either A, that's going to lead to a litigation fight or B, um, it may try to force the hand of decision makers into just simply um, pushing through solutions just to meet that goal, even if the trade-offs involved are maybe not what we would prefer in, in the long term or in the broader picture. I think it's just a recipe for, for potentially rushed or 
overly contentious decisions. That if we know the goals and we're we're focused and invested in reaching them, um, if we're off by a bit, there may be a very good reason, and there may be more flexible and, and reasonable ways to to stay on the long term track rather than having to artificially meet a specific goal at a specific time and also involve the potential for litigation in that whole mix um, as well. So we would recommend not including the cause of action and we would recommend keeping the goals as, as goals rather than hard requirements. Um, and frankly, if the legislature is more invested in the process by having to approve things and, you know, I think we have to have some, uh, faith in the process and faith in ourselves to, to reach those goals that we have rather than trying to construct artificial constraints that, you know, are meant maybe to force us to do what we want, what we say we want to do. But then I think in the real world, you can run into some, some practical, uh, practical and process problems. If you, if you don't quite meet the, the, the strict, uh, strict directions. Um, those are the sort of the four sort of broad three to four broad, uh, topics that, and, and, and recommendations that we make in terms of approach. Um, there's at least two little specific ones I just want to note real quickly, maybe for further discussion. And I apologize if this has been discussed further, uh, I had not seen that it was, is the concept of the net zero requirement across sectors. I think it'd be good to have a better understanding of what that means in practical terms. So the scenarios I would be concerned about is, even if you have the most, you know, uh, environmentally clean and efficient operation. If you're in a situation where, because it's almost impossible for any operation to have no impact, if the net zero requirement is actually would actually be a constraint on, say, for example, attracting new businesses or expanding existing existent businesses in the state, that would be, I think, a concern for us. And I, and I think it'd be good to have a better understanding of what exactly the bills practical impact would be in terms of having a net zero requirement at the end of this process. Um, and then the last one I'll do, and feel free to cut me off if I'm pushing the time a little bit. On page 25 in the energy policy section, uh, it makes, the bill makes changes to uh, uh, what is the least cost uh, standard for, for setting energy policy. Um, and least cost is a concept that is supposed to encompass and balance many competing, competing uh, factors and interests from economic to environmental and, and whatnot. And uh, that I think is a recognition that there are those many factors that need to be balanced uh, with each other. And I think existing least cost has terminology that would include greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, but this bill takes least cost, which encompasses all those various factors and takes out as one factor greenhouse gas reduction and sets it separate and equal to the entirety of the least cost basket. And just from, um, you know, sort of, of a framework and criteria perspective in terms of pursuing energy policy and regulatory decisions, um, I think we're concerned about sort of tipping the scale in terms of what the various, what the various factors are currently being considered. Um, I guess I would submit that least cost already has a, an approach that tries to incorporate and balance environmental goals with others. And if you separate one of the ingredients of least cost and treat that as equal to all others, I think it, it runs the risk of, of uh, upsetting that balance. And um, it may not seem like the biggest issue to some folks, but just from a, a, a policy and, and process perspective on energy issues, uh, we have concerns about that. So I just wanted to flag that, that issue for folks too. Great. That's, that's right. Thank you for uh, making, hitting the mark on time. <laughs> uh, and thank you for your input. Um, just as a quick note on that least cost principle, there is a docket open at the PUC, an investigation as part of Act 62 that does a, a much deeper dive on cost benefit analysis. So hopefully we'll get something from the PUC that will assist us on just that question. Um, and with that, I want to move on um, and thank, uh, I don't see Karen Horn at the moment. Yeah, she's there. Oh, there! I should recognize your picture, the, the flower garden. I've seen it before. Um, so to our last two witnesses, I apologize. We're going to need to ask you to 
aim for about 10 minutes of testimony, but uh, uh, that's our tight window today. So uh, if we have other questions, we'll certainly schedule more time with you uh, in the future. But so take it away, Ms. Horn. We can't hear you quite You're muted, yet. Karen. You're muted. I'll, I'll, while you're getting yourself unmuted, I'd say, you know, in reading the bill, I see there's a lot of uh, opportunity and requirements actually as well for uh, municipalities to be involved in this process. And I, so as I read it through many times, I said, I wonder what VLCT thinks of the bill. So, and we can't hear you. There you go. Oh, jeez. No, that's Jude's voice. I'm trying to unmute her. But... Wait, wait, wait. Oh, oh, there we are. Okay. Great. Yeah. Great. Okay. So um, I came down to the schoolyard for the internet, and that may have been a bad decision because there's a lot going on here today. So I apologize. In well, we hope you don't get hit by a ball or. <laughs> no, it's. Like that. It's an AOT construction site. Oh, okay. So thank you for the project. And hopefully it's not <laughs> noisy. Um, th thank you also for the opportunity to testify. Um, it, it's so ironic because things have changed completely since we testified in the House Energy Committee back on January 22nd. Um, the global economies shut down completely. And it's really shown us what the possibilities are in terms of environmental quality. It's also shown us what the hazards are to um, really to, to uh, human, human, human welfare in, in the economy when everything shuts down. Um, we are living disruptive history, you know that, but we feel pretty strongly that we need to learn from this. Um, and you have the opportunity to um, find the balance between global health, a global healthy economy, and one that serves um, people. Um, and I've, I come at it from this direction now because we've been spending a huge amount of time in the money committees in the um, legislature, Ways and Means, Finance, and Appropriations. So I, I would really urge you to look at the legislation with the lens of what can we learn from the last three months and what do we need to change in our approach going forward? Um, and then I'd, I'd like to just talk about a few specifics. Uh, age 688 would create a Climate Action Council of eight members and an Advisory Council of 14 members. We think both of those should be attached to the governor's office. We actually did testify to this in the House Energy Committee. Um, if it's attached to the governor's office, then uh, they can require action from all agencies and departments. So we would urge you to consider creating an Office of Climate Resiliency at the governor's office or administrative agency level. Um, and uh, the model that worked very well in the past was the uh, Irene recovery office after tropical storm Irene. So I, I would just ask you to give some consideration to that. We also urge you to require the council and the administration to consider current programs that are related to energy efficiency and renewable energy climate adaptation. There's a lot that's on the books today. And if we are going in um, this new concerted direction, we need to focus on what we do need to do at the state and local level, and then also at what we don't need to do, um, what's not uh, really effective anymore. Apologize for the background noise. Um, it would be helpful to include language that authorizes municipalities through their local legislative bodies 
to enact ordinances to address com climate resiliency generally. Um, we think that local governments have really proven themselves to be leaders during the COVID-19 crisis and uh, granting them some flexibility in this regard would let them uh, develop local solutions that might show the way for the, for the state moving forward. And then finally, I wanted to mention the cause of action as many of the other folks have. We've opposed the cause of action um, to an individual person uh, being able to sue based on the quote, failure to adopt or update the plan or rules. Uh, we testified in January in the House Energy Committee that our experience with the Clean Water Act, um, this is hitting close to home for you all, uh, was that it took seven years of litigation before anybody was really willing to invest any money in infrastructure improvements to actually mitigate the effects of, um, of phosphorus discharges to the waters of the state. Nobody really wanted to spend money to address those issues without assurance that there was that that money was going to be well spent in the final analysis. And I do think that that's a problem generally with cause of that citizen cause of actions. I think more importantly, the COVID-19 experience has shown that there may be priorities that co-opt a schedule that turn the economy upside down and that demand that government focus its attention on something other than the priority that, quote, any person deems most important. We do think that the government has to be able to address those emergencies when they occur without the threat of um, citizen cause of action on, on other issues. So uh, that's it for my testimony. I'm happy to take questions. Um, I did send my testimony to Jude, and so I believe it's posted on your website now, and it's fairly short. Thank you. Well, thank you for doing that. You, you always send in your written testimony, and it's helpful to hear it from you and then be able to read it again after. Uh, I have a, a brief question. Uh, we have two minutes left, and, and that is um, on empowering local governments to uh, 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 enact local solutions. I mean, I think, as I was saying while we were sorting out your connection, um, as I read the bill, there were a lot of places where I said, I wonder how municipalities are feeling as they read, think, thinking as they read this, because um, there are many, many impacts and they're gonna happen at the local level. Um, so what kind of, uh, what would be the hangups right now in current law that would include local governments from stepping up in just the way that you're talking about? Well, um, we are a Dillon's rule state. Yes. So, so if we want to do something that hasn't already been contemplated in legislation, we need to come ask permission. And you're all very well aware of that right now as you've been um, amending laws to allow towns to act during the COVID-19 crisis in innovative ways. So um, I, our, our concern is that um, there might be something that is uh, determined to be very helpful to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions at the local level that hasn't actually been authorized in um, specific language in the statute. And it's sort of an amorphous concern, it always is. We don't know what might arise you know, down the road. So, so that's sort of the general concern. We are thankful that the bill that passed the House does involve municipalities pretty substantially in the um, advisory committees, in addressing the specific needs in particularly in rural communities and what the impacts are gonna be in those communities as we move ahead. And then um, calling on, I would say, both the legislature and the administration to address those impacts um, and, and make sure that, that the requirements to reduce carbon emissions or ad address um, climate change and global warming don't 
um, unnecessarily and adversely impact, particularly folks in rural communities. And I think we're also seeing that right now. Um, this talks a little bit about telecommunications. I think telecommunications, when it's available to everybody in the state, is going to have a huge positive impact on the way we do um, business going forward from the point of view of climate change. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd love to stay in touch with you and maybe look at anything that would uh, address empowering local community and decision making in a way that would uh, help us achieve the goals in the bill. With that, um, thank you. Uh, turn to Mr. Costello. So I apologize, we have only 10 minutes at the moment, but you've been with us many times before. Um, uh, what would you like us to be thinking about as we review the bill? And we can't quite hear you yet, Paul. Sorry. Here we go. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Bray. And it's nice to see you in your Addison County, beautiful Addison County background there. Yeah. Uh, so Council on Rural Development, we're a neutral facilitator of public process. Uh, in line with what Karen said, we are on the ground in communities throughout the state. We've done deep processes around broadband and around community organizing and around climate work with 140 towns over the course of our history. Um, today, we're leading the uh, model climate economy model communities program. Uh, we've also held three major summits, including a national summit on climate innovation in Vermont. We've uh, I've co-chaired the Governor's Commission on Climate Action, and I also helped facilitate the Working Committee of the Climate Caucus as it set its annual work plan. We're a neutral facilitator that try to, tries to serve rural communities and the larger advancement of public policy that serves them. So we come into this without a, a left or right orientation, but much more about what works. And fundamentally, we're in, we're in support of Vermont businesses, and we look to the future of our economy in the conditions of climate change that where we're, we believe that Vermont is a rural state that's in the midst of a competition for market share in the fundamental uh, leading edge economy of the future, which is going to be a low carbon economy. And to be successful in that, competition, we need to look at ways to advantage businesses that will be successful in making adaptations, supporting entrepreneurs that are creative problem solvers that are going to invent solutions and drive solutions into the marketplace that uh, reduce carbon, that uh, localize agriculture, that produce efficiencies, that develop smart grid, that advanced electrified transportation and so many other arenas of action. One of the most fundamental things that we see uh, today is the impacts of COVID. Uh, I am the governor's appointed leader of his local solutions and community action uh, working group of the recovery task force. I'm pretty much spending full time on that. So I'm going to apologize in advance for not being close to the details of the bill in front of you. Um, I'm, I'm very aware of the, the big picture of the Global Warming Solutions Act, but I'm, I'm not familiar with the arguments that have been before you or the work that you've done to improve the bill to date. Right. Well, but Paul, I, can I pivot from a moment from that? Um, yeah. uh, because one of the things that's coming up that's uh, germane is the committee, all committees are being invited to think about how we might use uh, COVID relief funds or any federal funds that are going to be flowing to Vermont this year um, to uh, come out of the pandemic better. And then we went into it and not just rebuild. Uh, so one of the things that there's an opportunity for this committee to do and uh, is to participate in that discussion. So since you are working in exactly that and you have this energy background, do you see opportunities? So we're stepping away from Global Warming Solutions Act and we can schedule more time with you to come back to that. But what's maybe even more timely is 
this committee's potential input to appropriations and economic development on energy and environmental issues uh, that we could be addressing as part of recovery. And maybe we should schedule an, another meeting actually with you to come back to that. But we would like not to miss the chance to make improvements. Yeah, I'd love to come back. Uh, on Monday, you will each receive the report, interim report of our group to the governor, which is, is uh, coming out with recommendations around fundamental ways to stimulate the economy, respond to crisis at the local community level, and also think beyond recovery to resilience. And one of the most fundamental ones, which, it, which uh, is already part of the conversation here, is to drive towards universal broadband solutions. You have the ability to invest in that. There are opportunities to work with the CUDs, but also with the electric companies. And there's a deep discussion going on um, around the potential to leverage a partnership with electric utilities and, and uh, folks that are managing the grid. And so there's a, there's a lot of uh, work that is, is kind of coming of age in a time where we're looking at uh, functional injustice around the, the connectivity of people to telehealth, to educational opportunity, um, to the opportunity to drive and support a business from home or participate in the global economy. And these are issues that we've had for, that we've all been working on for a generation, but COVID, one of the lessons of COVID is we have to answer this as a fun functional challenge because Internet is no longer a, a nicety, it's an essential infrastructure that's necessary for people to participate in their, the local culture and uh, economic opportunity in the future. So you'll see that report and I'd be glad to come talk about elements of it. But I think the COVID crisis in terms of uh, some perspective on this, you know, one of the most fundamental things that we see from COVID and that almost everyone recognizes in the United States is the crucial role of science in evaluating the spread, the vector, the challenge, the potential for um, minimizing spread, all those issues which we're learning in terms of a slow moving pandemic that comes at the, you know, a relatively fast moving pandemic that comes at the United States. And you look at the tremendous job that Vermont has done to, to frame ways to avoid the worst impacts uh, that could have, could have hit us. When you think about the climate setting, we're, scientists are giving us just as clear messages. We're looking at a longer timeline, but we're looking at the fact that climate change is real today. It's already had significant impacts today Science can predict the cascading set of multiple impacts that are going to devastate communities and the economy of the future unless we're fully prepared for those. So when we think about climate in the COVID situation, we need to look much more straight and true to that science and the scientific perspective on what these impacts will be. The great thing is we have the ability to reflect and we have the knowledge today to know what some of the major solutions are, like electrification, like reducing phosphorus, like putting more carbon in the soil. We, we know these things. And one of the things that, you know- Paul, I, I, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Um, we have to leave in the, for the floor in one minute. Senator okay. McDonald's been holding a question for about two minutes. Senator, McDonald, can you jump in and ask our last question in the morning? And Paul, we'll come back because we ought to talk more about recovery um, and see if we can help uh, align the stars. Maybe, it, maybe the major thing that relates to energy for us will be supporting broadband uh, and the climate benefits there. Senator McDonald, you are still muted. Thanks for your work on the Governor's Commission on Climate change issues. My question was, as a result of that commission, what was the single most important thing that that commission dealt with? And then what is the next thing that the legislature has to take next? Uh, I can't speak for that whole group to say the single most important thing, but I can say two things that were at the very top of the list were uh, driving broadband to completion for all the multiple benefits. 
and and maybe the second one may be the first recommendation that we have, which is ending family homelessness in Vermont. We we don't believe that families at the end of this crisis should be going back to the streets, that or or, or going back to homeless shelters. That we need to develop uh, a concerted platform of work to to bring them into housing, and and so there's there's a lot more in the report, but those are two of the biggest picture drivers that. That we think are crucial. Okay, thank you. So, thank you so much, thank Senator, I'm sorry, I, sorry to be philosophical when you're working hard on the details of the bring, bill. Bring it, bring um, it on. I'm glad to think of you again in future. So, thanks so much, uh, Paul, for jumping in. And we will uh, reconnect, I think, on the recovery stuff and find ways to, to, as a committee to participate in trying to see that the recovery as it relates to energy environment issues. In, embraces some of the opportunities that are in play at the moment. And with that, we are adjourned uh, with four minutes to spare before the floor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for your leadership.